Hi everyone, thanks for meeting with me today. My name is Amber Hibble and I'm going to discuss my role as an educational interpreter in your classroom. I thought this picture down here at the bottom was pretty comical. You know, keep calm, I know sign language. I know uh, having a deaf or hard of hearing student in your classroom may be uncharted territory for some of you and that is why we are having this presentation today to just kind of go over some things and calm maybe some nerves that we might be feeling. So let's get started. So the role of an interpreter, you know, what do I do? My job is to facilitate communication between the deaf and hard, deaf or hard of hearing student and people that they may come in contact with, such as yourself, various staff, administrators, service providers, par parents, and their peers. You know, I'm in the classroom to make sure that you can communicate with them and they can communicate with you. The interpreter is definitely a vital part of the IEP team. We offer valuable input. You know, if the student is working on a specific goal, something they are trying to achieve, I work one-on-one -on -one with the student on a daily basis. And so I will be able to inform the IEP team the student is struggling with this or they have been successful in this part. And so we definitely work together in that way to make sure the student is successful. Um, I interpret in the classroom, tutoring if that is needed for the student, various field trips, assemblies, state and district testing, and the IEP meetings. There are other optional interpreting possibilities that could come up, such as before or after school activities, sports, various clubs that the student may want to participate in, overnight field trips, staff meetings, and prep. So my responsibility as an interpreter, I am a qualified and licensed professional, just like yourself. I have been to schooling. I have gone through state licensure to be an educational interpreter. As an interpreter, it is my responsibility to communicate and adapt as a member of the educational team regarding interpreting and communication. I am to support the goals of the IEP, whatever that process may look like for the student, um, their yearly progress to completely support whatever the goals may come up. And if they change, I am then to support and assist in that process as well. I am responsible to be fluent in written and spoken English, as well as ASL or what, whatever sign mode that the student is using. Um, if you're not familiar with ASL as a language, there are different modes that the student could use. They could use signed English. So that is my responsibility to figure out that mode and match the language needs of the student. I am responsible to produce and understand adolescent signers. I am also responsible to understand the various stages that child development, particularly relating to the language development and the stages that they are going to go through and what that looks like to be able to know are they meeting those standards or, or are they not. Um, I'm also responsible to be aware and alert of specific language development of the students and grade specific academic content. Now these are various technologies that you could see in your classroom. Here on the left is a cochlear implant and on the right is a hearing aid. Now John uses a cochlear implant, the one here on the left. Really we could discuss how these technologies work and what they do and the differences so on and so forth but what is really important to take away today is neither technology makes it that the student can hear 100 percent. Oftentimes what happens is the student takes in environmental information, the brain has to process it, figure out where it's coming from. It is not at all hearing like we hear on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, if they take in sound, oftentimes it is muffled. It is not clearly heard or understood. It can seem as though the person is whispering when really they're not. Um, due to environmental noise, kids talking, laughing, papers moving, reverberation in the classroom, echoes, all of these things play into both cochlear implants and hearing aids. 
So it's important to remember that just because they use these doesn't mean they can hear. It's simply a tool to assist them in the process of being aware of noise that they may incur. Next, we have an FM, FM system and a classroom speaker. Now, the FM system you will see, John does use one with his cochlear implant. This is actually a really cool technology to use. As you see here on the right, the teacher is wearing a neck band that actually has a transmitter that will and a microphone. So whatever you say will feed into the microphone and transmit to the cochlear implant on the student. So then that way it's a direct feed into, into their processing um, unit where they can actually then get rid of all that background noise. It can make it seem like you're standing right next to the student, which is a huge, huge thing to have in the classroom. Because again, if you're standing too far away, you know, that distance factor, or if you're talking to another student, you know, that really plays into affecting whether the student is going to be able to understand. So this gets rid of that and allows you to then speak into this microphone naturally, and then it just goes right directly to this student, which is really great. This is a classroom speaker on the right. That is just kind of like a microphone system spoke into, and it's actually then it the source is made louder for everyone to hear. You won't specifically see this one used with John, but you may incur that in a di with a different deaf and hard of hearing student. Now this is the CPC, the Code of Professional Conduct, uh, that I am required to follow as a licensed educational interpreter. I am to follow the student's IEP or Section 504 plan. I am to maintain confidentiality. This is very important. Uh, anything that is shared is on a need-to-know basis. Just as many of you professionals, I am a mandatory reporter. So anything that the deaf student may share with me, uh, you know, I use my best judgment. And if that needs to be shared or reported, I am mandated to report that. Uh, I am to maintain professional boundaries with the student to respect their privacy and to foster their independence. I am also, like I mentioned before, to meet their language needs. I am to conduct myself appropriately in this academic setting. I am to be respectful to the students and my colleagues like yourself. I am to engage in professional development. So I am, I go to various classes or workshops to continue to improve my skill as an educational interpreter. This next one I think is very important. I am to prepare for classroom academic content. This includes previewing books and teacher lesson plans. We will be working very closely um, with this one specifically because it is vital to an interpreter to have your lesson plan to know um, what's going to be on the test. How am I, am I going to assign the questions? Um, what is that going to look like? Are the videos captioned? You know, can the student read those captions? Or am I going to um, get up and sign those, those videos? Um, it's very important to know what is going on in the classroom, to read the books and prepare myself to be able to then sign this effectively to meet the language needs of the student depending on where the student is. So this is very important for interpreters to be able to prep and get that information from the teachers to facilitate that communication and make this learning environment as successful as possible for the student. And then the rest of these feed into that uh, being able to look at the educational films, know the vocabulary, and then provide the information to you on how to access and utilize captioned media if the student go, does use captioned media. So what will, the, what will happen in your classroom? You know, the, there is going to be movement of the interpreter, especially in the middle school setting where we're at with John in sixth grade. Uh, you use a lot of maps, visual aids, PowerPoints, move around the classroom, you know, in science class, doing experience, experiments, different groups. I will be moving with the student. I will be pointing to the various visual aids that you use to help foster that education better. Um, again, I said John uses an FM system, so a little bit of etiquette with that. That microphone, I can show you. Um, we can work more closely one-on-one -on -one to know that that microphone is directly on you all the time. So if you're wearing a necklace or you scratch 
um, at it. All of that noise then gets directly defeated into or gets directly feeded. I'm sorry, into their system, and they can hear all of that noise. Um, also, if you're working one on one with a different student and you still have the microphone on, they can hear that. If they're trying to work separately on a project, then that can interfere. So there is a mute button. So we'll we can get hands on with that and look closely into what that looks like. Also, the importance of lighting and captioning. Lighting is vital. I mean, if you turn off the lights and we watch a movie and it's not captioned and I have to sign it, he has to be able to see me. So we have to have some type of lighting system set up or just be aware that the lights need to be on in order for him to see me. Um, captioning again, uh, I can send you some links and we can um, work closely to have videos captioned if they can be. So then he can actually read them on there and those don't need to be signed for him. When working with with John, he has a cochlear implant, so sometimes he can directly get information from the person that he's working with. He has learned to cope and read lips, so he may not always be looking directly at me. He may may uh, break eye contact, look at his peers, look at the teacher. He's still getting the information, but if he's not one-on-one -on -one staring at me the whole time, it doesn't mean he's not paying attention. It means that he is using other modes to get the information. And also, um, just working with a sixth grade student at this point in time in their life, fostering independence for adult transition, working into high school is very important. We want to make it so he can um, be independent one day. So then we ask of him and he will learn how to request interpreters for after school activities if he wants to do things like that or be able to advocate for himself you know, saying that he didn't understand something or raise his hand and ask you specifically as the teacher and not depend so much on the interpreter. And this is what we see at the middle school level. So that is something that he is going to be doing and that we will be working on. And I will keep you up to date on that as well. This is just some of the resource and contact information. If you have um, interest in this and you want to research and dig deeper down into the things that we've discussed today, I've left some links here, different good websites to go take a gander at. Um, and then this is my contact information on the bottom. Please feel free to contact me at any time. My, um, my number's on there. You can call me, text me is fine as well, or my email, either way works. And I just want to thank you so much for taking the time out to come today and be able to engage and share with you this information to make John's education as successful as possible. Thanks again.